All right. Okay, so good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm Teresa Dilworth, the Vice President of the North Fork Audubon Society. And on behalf of our program committee and all of our board members, we are delighted to have today Nicholas Guardiano, PhD, joining us from Southern Illinois. He will be presenting La Forest on an American Frontier, John James Audubon's Artistic Rambles and Spirited Creatures. Um, so Nick comes to us from Southern Illinois and here is a, a map from 1810 that shows, uh, I think that's roughly where, where Nick is. Um, here is the border of Kentucky, which you can, the north border of Kentucky, you can see fairly clearly. And these are the states that existed east of the Mississippi. And Indiana, I don't believe, even existed as a state at the time. Um, and there was it's about uh, 1100 miles between uh long island and um illinois this part of illinois and what what struck me when i was reading audubon's uh one of his biographies is the amount of uh okay so google maps said this would take me 16 days to walk if i if i walked 66 miles per day and in Audubon's time, people routinely walked hundreds of miles. Um, so um, Nick is the Alwyn C. Karras Archivist and Associate Professor of Philosophy at Southern Illinois University Carbondale, where he specializes in American transcendentalism and pragmatism, metaphysics, aesthetics, philosophy of nature, semiotics, and 19th century American art. He has a very impressive resume, including numerous philosophical writings, and he is the winner of many awards, prizes, grants, and scholarships. His latest book in progress, John James Audubon in Illinois, Artistic Rambles on an American Frontier, provides the historical, biographical, and geological contexts of Audubon's treks around frontier Illinois between 1810 and 1819 as the Illinois countryside was transitioning from a remote backwater to an established wing of the US. So I have never actually met Nick until tonight um, by Zoom, uh, but my personal connection to him is that he, he was an undergraduate student in philosophy at SUNY Stony Brook, and he was a student of my father uh, philosophy professor David A. Dilworth, who is on this Zoom as well, uh, who is currently 89 years old and still teaching full time at Stony Brook, and who also frequently volunteers helping me with trail work at Inland Pond County Park in Greenport. So Nick and my father have kept in touch over the years. And in 2020, during the pandemic, Nick sent my father an essay that he had written about John Audubon. My father forwarded it to me and said, you have to read this essay about <laughs> Audubon that my former student sent me. So although I was somewhat familiar with Audubon's bird paintings, reading Nick's essay really opened up my eyes to John Audubon as a person um, and led to buying some books about Audubon and um, uh, Nick's essay was a direct influence on my decision to seek out and to join a local chapter of the Audubon Society. So that's how and why I joined the North Fork Audubon Society and became a board member. Uh, I have posted a link to Nick's essay in the Zoom comments. So uh, please take the opportunity to download it uh, since we're going to take it off our website. Um, after the program to honor a request from Nick's publisher. Um, so th these are just some pictures of John Audubon that he painted a self portrait on the left, painted in oils, and then um, some pictures of his, his three children. Uh, one, his daughter died uh, very early uh, as a toddler, but the two sons survived. And I couldn't find any oil paintings that he did of his wife 
Lucy Audubon, I don't know whether it's because he didn't paint her or whether they just didn't survive, but I did find an old photograph of his wife, Lucy, and a picture of Audubon's 14-acre estate in Manhattan along the Hudson River, uh, just north of 155th Street. He, um, he did live in New York toward the end of his life, and I believe he may have uh, died in New York um, in 1851. I'm not exactly sure if he died in New York, but um, at the end of his life, he lived in New York City. Um, so just before I hand it over to Nick, I wanted to just show one other self-portrait of Audubon. This is in his Golden Eagle painting in the Birds of America, and you can see uh, John Audubon in the lower left-hand corner. Um, the Golden Eagle is about the size of a bald eagle. Uh, currently endangered, but in, in Audubon's day, it was, even in Audubon's day, it was rare. So uh, this close-up shows Audubon, um, you know, having shot a, a, a golden eagle, and he strapped it on his back to bring it back home in, or, in order to paint it. And some conveniently, uh, there's a tree that uh, somebody had put across uh, a, a gorge, which uh, kind of created a bridge and, you know, probably cut off uh, miles of of walking uh, on the way back. Um, so, but the thing that impressed me the most about this picture was that he's using an ax to uh, smooth out the, the jagged branches that are sticking up, because you, you can imagine if you're straddling a trunk of a tree like this, you know, these jagged branches would be very uncomfortable. So that I, I was impressed by that. So so I guess um, now we can I turn it over to Nick to uh, start his presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Teresa. That was great. You have a nice personal insight of my background with the connection with your father and all. We did actually meet one time though, and I remember it, it was. Oh. Um, yeah, it was on Long Island. It was with my now wife. She was not at the moment at the time. And we were uh, on the north exploring the vineyards. And uh, you didn't know me. And I told you who I was and then started to ask you for some uh, um, any kind of like stories to tell me about Professor Dilworth, <laughs> who, you know, I love and has been my mentor throughout my whole life for since I started philosophy, which was over 20 years ago. So, um, yeah, thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to share my screen now. <clears throat> and we'll dive in. I'm going to go to full screen. Hope you all can see that all right. <clears throat> okay. Title of my presentation is La, For La Forest on an American Frontier, John James Audubon's Artistic Rambles and Spirited Creatures. So La Forest, John James Audubon, he, he translated his name from the French version to English when he came over, uh, when he emigrated from France when he was 18 years old. And his middle name was actually, it meant uh, the fern in French, and he changed that to La Forest, um, generalizing on that term. His wife used to call him it, so I guess it was a, a, a you know personal nickname of his, and I think it fits him very well. And, and you'll 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 see why as I go through my presentation. <clears throat> Oops. Okay, so here's the plan for today. I'm going to start off with a little bit of an introduction on Audubon, just real brief, who he is and his uh, nature books. And the reason why I want to cover these briefly is because there's a peculiar thing about Audubon, which is that his name is widespread. Um, he, any, most people in there in, um, have heard the name through the Audubon Society, but may not know anything about who this artist naturalist was. Um, so we're, I'm just going to back up and kind of give a brief intro to him and his famous work, The Birds of America. 
And then I'm going to get started with um, moving on to talking about some of his outdoor explorations or what do you like to call them is rambles. And as a contextual lead up to that section two, La Fares Kairos moment on the frontier and an American philosophical ethos of rambling. This is going to situate uh, section three, where I'm going to give you some samples or stories about some of his different outdoor explorations. And then finally, in section four, we're going to look at some of Autobahn's great art. Um, and I'm going to discuss some of the philosophical ideas that are behind his painting. Okay, so to begin, we have this, we have John James Lafour or Laforest Autobahn, born in 1785, passed away in 1851. And I believe that is right, Teresa, that he did pass away in New York. I know that is the final place where he lived with his family. He was a French American. He had he lived his childhood in France. Um, his father was actually a commander of the of the uh, in the French Navy. And Audubon was sent to the United States by his father when he was 18. He first moved to Pennsylvania at, to an estate of his father's um, called Millgrove. And then he worked his way further west to Louisville, Kentucky, and then further down the Ohio to Henderson, Kentucky, which is which then was very much right on the frontier, the western frontier of uh, the young United States. This would have been the first decade of uh, the 19th century. As time went by and he started to try to collect more specimens of birds, he moved around. He ended up in Louisiana for a while and he finally moved to New York. He was a merchant of dry goods on the frontier in his early life. This would have uh, this was around 1810 to 1820. And I'm going to discuss that a little bit because it was this kind of transition point in his life leading up to his move to focusing full time on his art and the study of nature. He was both a naturalist and an artist, so not just one or the other, but both. He was, he had some minimal training in these fields in France, um, but he was largely um, autodidactic in his learning. He had at hand some ornithological cabinets, for example, in Philadelphia at the time when he lived in Pennsylvania, he would go visit those. He also had available to him um, the some of the catalogs that were available, the naturalistic catalogs that were available, although he was trying to improve on those. So he studied these items and he had nature at his hands. So he learned much from there and then he explored experimentally in his art. So his method as a naturalist and artist, as I say there at the bottom, was experiential. There are these frontier rambles, his outdoor explanation, explorations that were crucial to um, forming his abilities as a naturalist and artist. Um, and he also committed himself to uh, the science of nature too. So he also took various scientific measurements of his birds, he even, um, did experiments on them um, when they were dead, but even when alive, he, there was some vivisection that he conducted. This famous book, The Birds of Amer America, released 1827 to 1838, his most monumental achievement. It's a monumental achievement in nature painting, scientific study, and book printing too. It was the most comprehensive ornithological record of bird species in North America and a treasured artistic reproduction of American wildlife. It was four volumes in extent on double elephant folio paper. And you can see just how large that is in the images here. Look at the top image with the people who are turning the pages carefully with two hands. It is a big book about, uh, I had the measurements there, 38 inches by 26 inches. Across these four volumes were 435 plates, and those plates covered 497 species of birds, all known species in the North America at the time. So some of the plates had more than one bird on them. It cost him $2 million and 20 years to produce. And it was released um, serially and on the basis of subscribers. So he had to seek out people who would um, 
be beneficiaries for the project. And he furthermore managed um, the release of the volumes. Um, he managed the subscribers. He managed the uh, production process with the engravers and the colorists who would who would who would be there to at that time one would need to actually hand color um, the prints as they were produced. It also required him to make extensive travels across um, the remote areas of the continent at the time. This included the Midwestern frontier, the Southern bayous, the upper Missouri River where Lewis and Clark explored, uh, the Florida Keys and seas and the seas of Newfoundland. Um, it's also one of the most expensive books sold at auction in modern history. So in 2018, I found that Christie's had sold a copy of it for $9.65 million. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. It wasn't the only book that Audubon produced. Alongside the Birds of America was the Ornithological Biography. And this was a companion text. So this contained all the information um, about the birds that he was depicting in the four volume artistic work. The Ornithological Biography was released from 1831 to 1839, and it came, um, it totaled five volumes. In addition to having essays, um, there that in addition to having entries that were on the different bird species so he had an entry on every individual bird species in the ornithological bi biography but he also had essays about his outdoor explanation exploration so they were uh biographical pieces talking about where he lived and what he did and what he saw so these were uh interleaved amongst the different um scientific essays on the birds Later in his life, he followed up the Birds of America and its companion text with another one that was on land animals, uh, land mammals uh, that walk on land, not fly over land. And this was called, the name of this text was called The Viviparous Quadrupeds of North America, which I just love saying that word. Um, it was released from 1845 to 1848. This was very much towards the end of his life. He passed away in 51. And in fact, he needed his son uh, to help him finalize it. So it wasn't um, just a solo work of John James Audubon's. It was a three volume follow-up text on land mammals. And you can see um, in some of the images there, his squirrel uh, played, his buffalo uh, played, and one of a very fierce looking otter. That painting there, he used to actually reproduce um, um, for for different people who are interested in his work and his benefactors and give it to them as gifts. And one time he gave one of those paintings to a wealthy British aristocrat woman who turned rejected it because it was too scary and didn't want to hang it in her house. So he actually made a second uh, painting of the otter where it wasn't uh, showing its teeth. Okay, <clears throat> moving on to the next section here, La For Us. Kairos moment on the frontier and an American philosophical ethos of rambling. I have a, so like Teresa's map, here's another map from 1804 of the United States. During the time Audubon was rambling about the country, much of the land was primitive in its natural historical setting. His merchant career placed him in the remote markets of the West bordering on a frontier landscape, which effectively began at the Ohio River and Louisville and existed until around 1830 when settlers began to move in mass. And so Louisville is gonna be about central Connecticut there, uh, Kentucky there, um, right up on the uh, Northern border on the Ohio. And then um, I'll use my cursor here. So here's where Louisville is and was, and you go down the Ohio a bit further, then you end up in Henderson, Kentucky, and that's right on the border of Illinois territory at the time. So neither Illinois or Indiana were states in 1804, actually. So this map's slightly misleading. Um, it, it looks like they're states, the modern states with the modern borders. That's not state, that was not the case in 1804. Um, you had Indiana territory established in 1800, 
Illinois territory was established in 1809. Autobahn moves to Henderson, Kentucky right here in 1810. And so across the river of the Ohio, um, immediately across so it was a it was a it was a river town that he was in so not quite a rock throw but almost a rock throw you had in the illinois territory on the other side of the ohio and indiana would become a state in 1816 and illinois a state in 1818 this was a this time that autobahn was in the united states he came he, he emigrated in 1803 and he moves out to the frontier around 1809 1810 this was a transition period in the united states and its history um, the country was mostly still pre-industrial and nature was still richly abundant and diverse in its range of species. Audubon observed extinct species as well as large mammals in places they no longer roam today, like bison, cougar, and bear. He traveled by primitive means, stagecoach and flatboat, through old growth forests and untamed rivers and swamps. And he, con and he contended with swarms of insects that could kill large animals. And in fact, did. There's a story about a swarm of biting flies that once came up from the Illinois prairies and bit his horse, his horse so fiercely that it, uh, it died from it. I could tell you more of that story later if you'd like to hear. This was, th these accounts though are, are out there. Audubon wasn't the only one to, to experience these things. La Forest Kairos moment. So paralleling the transition period of the early United States, Audubon also experienced his own transition moment in his personal life. From an early age and as a boy residing in the French countryside, La Forest had a passion for nature and art. After emigrating to the United States and while working in the commercial trades of the young country, he never lost sight of what he recognized as his true vocation to become a great naturalist and artist. This crucial period of his 20s and his 30s was invigorated by his outdoor rambles about the frontier edges of Indiana and Illinois territories. Ultimately, it culminated in his decision to abandon the relative security of his merchant career for a life exploring nature and the composition of his greatest work, The Birds of America. So I have a couple of quotes here of Audubon reflecting on that Kairos moment, that uniquely qualitative moment of his life. That first quote up top here, he says, I'll read it. For a period of nearly 20 years, my life was a succession uh, of vicissitudes. So he's saying back when he was um, a merchant. I tried various branches of commerce, but they all proved unprofitable, doubtless because my whole mind was ever filled with my passion for rambling and admiring those objects of nature from which alone I received the purest gratification. That's actually in the introduction to an ornithological biography. And then in another essay that he writes, reflecting on his method of drawing and painting, he says, this is the bottom quote, I have followed slowly but constantly my object. I have often listened to the different observations of men who accidentally had made remarks on different species of birds, but seldom, except when with the rough hunters and squatters of the frontiers, have I discovered naked facts in such relations. I am persuaded that alone in the woods or at my work, painting, I can make better use of the whole of myself than in any other situation. Direct experiences of nature nourished Autobahn's soul on multiple levels, aesthetic, scientific, and religious, and were crucial to informing his artistic and ornithological works. He possessed a rambling ethos that was one with the greater philosophical and artistic currents in 19th century America. The New England transcendentalists, in particular, celebrated the elevating power of firsthand encounters with nature while challenging sedentary, conventional, economized, and vicarious modes of living. So to give you some examples of that, we have at the top here, this top quote is from Ralph Waldo Emerson, the forefather of the New England transcendentalists. And this quote is from the American scholar. And the American scholar, he identifies 
three influences on the education of the person. He names books and practical experience as two of those, but thirdly is nature. And he says that nature is the first in time and the first in importance on the education of the person. Similarly, another transcendentalist and a student of Emerson's, Henry David Thoreau, um, he will probably know Thoreau from his famous experiment of living at Walden Pond in, in Concord, Massachusetts for two years in a, in a cabin that he built, a one-bedroom cabin that he built um, of, um, by himself. Thoreau, reflecting on that time in his book, Walden on the Experience, says, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life, and see if I could not learn what it had to teach, and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. I wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life. And then I have a third quote here from Autobahn, which nicely parallels those quotes by the transcendentalists. He says, to study nature was to ramble through her domains. So if we're going to learn about nature, we need to get out there. Late and early and at every hour. That anywhere there I, there I might, if capable, obtain a serviceable lesson. Not perhaps in the manner through which I would have grandized my fortune, but in one by which I would enlarge my physical and perhaps also my mental powers. Not about making money, but enriching the soul. Autobahn would make careful observations of his bird subjects in the field and perform experiments on them in order to study their anatomy. He also uniquely focused his, as his attention on their behavioral norms, especially studying the rich social and emotional aspects of each, as he said, quote, little citizen of the feathered tribe. He insisted over and over again that his final goal was for his art, um, that his final goal for his art was that it was to be, quote, drawn from nature. That is nothing staged, fake, exaggerated, or artificial. That statement drawn from nature, he dutifully affixed at the bottom of each plate throughout the birds of America. And here in the image, you can see we have, I, I'm giving you the plate of, the, of, of, of uh, um, what was this one? The prairie chickens, I think. Um, and I'm zooming in on the bottom left there on the caption. And that caption you can see says drawn from nature. So this is at the bottom of most of Audubon's plate throughout, plates throughout his book, The Birds of America. That was very important to him. The Hudson River School. Likewise, the contemporary, contemporaneous landscape painters of the Hudson River School, for example, Thomas Cole, Asher Duran, Frederick Church, Albert Bierstadt, they also used an artistic method that began with venturing forth into undeveloped wilderness areas in the Northeast. Carrying a backpack of art supplies, they literally immersed themselves in their subject matter, that is the natural landscape, making sketches and field notes, which they later used to work up um, um, to work up their complete paintings in their studios. So this painting here is by Thomas Cole, who's one of the founding uh, individuals of the Hudson River School. And this is painting the Oxbow. It's of a, a region in Connecticut. And if you look down at the bottom towards the middle, if you can see my cursor, cursor, I'm circling the painter, Thomas Cole, right there, immersed in the landscape. You can hardly see him. He's got a canvas in front of him too. He's doing his painting. And over here is his backpack with his umbrella. Okay, so take that as context of some of Autobahn's rambles and his art, which I'm gonna to turn to now. So here's moving on to section three, Autobahn's art artistic rambles. I'm gonna re relate some stories for in particular of Autobahn's outdoor um, explorations. <clears throat> The first of the Eastern Phoebe, and there's his plate on the left of the bird. During Audubon's first year in the United States at age 19, this was in 1804, 
He made his first scientific effort at closely observing a bird species in the wild. Nearby his home at Millgrove, Pennsylvania, one spring, he watched from the edge of a small cave, a Phoebe pair tending its nest and bearing a brood of chicks. Audubon devoted himself to spending the majority of each day within the cave in order to record the unfolding of events, including the exciting arrival of the new hatchlings. He says, and here's the quote on your screen, the knowledge that in an enclosure so frail, life already existed, and that ere many weeks would elapse, a weak, delicate, and helpless creature, but perfect in all its parts, would burst this shell and immediately call for the most tender care of its parents, filled my mind with as much wonder as when looking towards the heaven, I searched in vain for the true import of all I saw. It's a miracle of life. Some of the pre precious hatchlings Audubon carefully handled. He also banded them by wrapping silvered thread around their legs. The following spring, after the winter migration period, he found some of the banded birds in nearby nests. This is the first successful attempt at bird banding in the United States. Uh, whoops, let's see this one here. Yeah. Okay, Autobahn also, here's another outdoor ramble of his, this one about some American Swifts. In July 1808, just outside Louisville, Kentucky, Autobahn learned of a dead sycamore tree with a hollowed out trunk where a flock of Swifts came to roost that night. The massive tree stood at a height of approximately 70 feet and with a diameter of eight feet. At sunset and sunrise, Audubon observed thousands of birds streaming out and into the tree by a hole above, a process that he said took 30 minutes and made a roaring sound. In order to gain a better look at the action inside the tree, he axed a hole through the bottom of the trunk and climbed in. He says, the interior of the tree was a matted mass of exuviae with rotten feathers reduced to a kind of mold in which, however, I could perceive fragments of insects and quills. I had a passage cleared, or rather, bored through this mass for nearly six feet. Above him, using a lantern, he perceived swift after swift, clinging to the interior walls of the full extent of the tree trunk. Audubon would estimate that there were 9,000 birds in all. And you can see on the left, I found this historical image of an old growth uh, sycamore tree. And you can see the men at the bottom standing shoulder by shoulder to get a sense of the scale of how large that tree is. And then I thought I would supply you with one for my own outdoor ramble. I found an old growth sycamore tree about four weeks ago um, in Illinois on the Ohio River, actually, in a state park called Bell Woods. An early settler to the area in 1826 named Timothy Flint called the sycamore the king of the western forests. Okay. Moving on to his observations of the passenger pigeons, more than once Audubon witnessed the awe-inspiring flocks of the now extinct passenger pigeons or wild pigeons as they were called. It is estimated that 3 billion pigeons existed on the North American continent at the time of European discovery. One, then that was that would have been one third of all birds on the continent, 3 billion. In the fall of 1813, while traveling from his home in Henderson, Kentucky to Louisville, Kentucky, Audubon encountered a train of them soaring overhead. He says, the air was literally filled with pigeons. The light of noonday was obscured as by an eclipse. The dung fell in spots, not unlike melting flakes of snow. And the continued buzz of wings had a tendency to lull my senses to repose. The birds continued undiminished to stream overhead throughout the entire day and 150 mile extent of Autobahn's journey. And they would continue to do so for three more days afterwards. Three days of 
passenger pigeons streaming overhead. Fortunately, by the 20th century, the pigeons ultimately met the fate of overhunting with the last known dying in captivity in 1914. And you can see in the bottom right, I've given you another historical image um, of men hunting the passenger pigeon. By the way, some folks are have their audio on, so you might want to check if you're muted. That bottom, bottom right image there of the men shooting the pasture pigeons, at the time, people would just indiscriminately like pick them off because it was just so easy. You could just aim blindly and hit them. And people would use them um, to feed their own livestock. They would have dogs come and collect them, and then they would pile up wagon loads and truck them away. So you can see why they may have gone extinct. Another ramble of Audubon's was a 14-week river trip around the Illinois Peninsula. Between 1819 and eight, uh, 18, excuse me, between 1810 and 1819, Audubon made several visits to the sparsely settled Illinois country. He explored its untamed rivers and bottomlands and observed its abundant wildlife. During one 14-week one 14 week river trip through the winter of 1810-1811, Audubon rounded the tip of Illinois on a flat boat, first floating down the Ohio River, then painstakingly hauling the cordel, as he called it, against the icy currents of the Mississippi River, and finally walking 150 miles back to his home in Kentucky on an old Indian road, as he called it. Along the way, he observed large mammals like wolf, cougar and bear, fondly conversed and hunted with Shawnee and Osage uh, Native Americans. He also studied a number of unusual bird species, including the Carolina parakeet, which is now extinct, trumpeter swans, and prairie chickens. Audubon also cited his famous bird of Washington, which was one of only a handful of sightings he made throughout his lifetime. Today, it is debated whether Audubon actually identified a new species or whether he may have sighted an immature bald eagle in piebald plumage. So um, I'll point out some of the images here on the slide. The bottom right, that's from Audubon's book on mammals. So that's his image of the black bear, which he saw around Illinois territory. The top middle, you have the bird of Washington. On the right, that's a uh, an old depiction of an Osage Indian. On the left, um, I found this image of what it looked like to haul the cordel. So this required literally pulling your flat boat that weighed many pounds up uh, against the up and against the current of a major river like the Mississippi River or the Ohio River. It would take several men to do this, and you'd be lucky after doing this all day, slogging through the mud, slipping on the sand, rocks, debris, driftwood, um, Lewis and Clark had to do this. Um, one would be lucky um, to, to make eight to 10 miles in an entire day of drudgery. Okay, I'm gonna move on to my final section here, philosophical expressions of bird painting. Audubon's paintings created by his unique artistic vision capture a number of big ideas about nature. More than pretty pictures, his paintings express a worldview and beautiful form. And so there are a few aspects of that worldview, or we could call them philosophical ideas expressed in his painting. And I'm gonna take one uh, each individually. The first I call aesthetic pluralism. Audubon set the ambitious goal of the birds of America to capture all the hundreds of bird species in America and to do so while presenting each species in its unique qualitative immediacy. That is how each appears in direct experience. And we can further add in the direct experience of an experienced birder with a keen eye for what presents itself. So here's a, here's a Audubon's painting of the Carolina parrot or Carolina parakeet. And in a moment, I'll show you another one of his tri called Heron. In order to capture the aesthetic pluralism or the qualitative immediacy of birds, uh, his method involved painting the precise hues and subtle textures of their plumage. 
as well as representing the special twists and turns of their bodies and capturing minimalistic details, for example, the barbs and barbules of feathers, along with the complex, op along with the complex optical effects that these produce. And you can see I zoom in on the tail feathers, the powered on the bottom of the painting here, in order to show you just how much detail Audubon painstakingly uh, represented here in the tail feathers of this one parrot. So he's got all the barbules and the all the barbs and barbules depicted here in each feather, as well as the different optical, the different lighting effects that are occurring as a result of that texture of the feather. And here is his painting of the tricolored heron. And you can see in the eye of the heron, Audubon depicts the color of the iris, as well as the folds of the eyelids, of the skin of the eyelids, and the tail feathers of the birds. Of the bird, once again, he gets all those individual streaks there, not just painting it as one block. And in the skin of the leg, Audubon um, is attentive to the actual color and patterning of the skin. Audubon's goal was to capture nature true to its appearance. For, uh, uh, Audubon's goal to capture nature true to its appearance further governed his preference for watercolor because it was available in so many color hues. Likewise, it motivated his experimentations in multimedia that layered pastel oil, ink, and pencil. So Audubon would make these paintings, these multimedia paintings of the birds, and then they would have to get uh, transferred um, to uh, the etched plates for the Birds of America and printed. Another idea expressed in Audubon's paintings is what I call scientific realism. Every effort was made to represent nature and its species kinds true to size and anatomically accurate. The aim was scientific precision in order to produce not only an artistic portfolio, but the preeminent modern ornithological text, which was always drawn from nature. As he explains, my wish was to impart truths, my wish to impart truths has been my guide in every instance. Hence, Audubon's artistic scientific method of rambling that consisted in countless hours spent observing birds in their natural environment and the taking of specimens back to his studio in order to inspect their features more closely. Audubon also innovated the method of pinning fresh specimens to a position board um, with grid lines. This allowed him to accurately measure and transfer the physical scale of a bird onto his drawing paper with matching lines. And you can see a reproduction of that position board in the middle image there. On the right, I have some drawing instruments that Audubon would have used in order to take scientific measurements of the birds. And on the left is a, a different ornithological text that was around from the same period as Audubon. And you can see how the aim here, the goal was scientific precision. Um, you have these flat, um, not so artistic representations of the different anatomical features of the bird. So this book is William Turton's A General System of Nature. Here are Audubon's paintings of the Scarlet Tanager, Great Egret, and Frigate Bird. Audubon's paintings thus represent birds in life-size scale. Their bodies splayed out and shown from different angles, and they even sometimes include diagrams of anatomical parts. In addition to his paintings, his extensive scientific observations are recorded in his five volume companion with um, companion work, Ornithological Biography, which compiles information on distribution, abundance, plumage, diet, calls and songs, nests, courtship of mates, and many other physical features and social behaviors. So you can see in the Scarlet Tanager, um, this top-down flat perspective of the uh, bird there in order to uh, get, a, get a clear understanding of its different anatomical parts, its wings, its tail, et cetera. On the bottom left, I gave you uh, Audubon's egret plate because I wanted to show you how, um, due to the fact that he insisted on painting every species, 
um, at life size that sometimes with the big birds, um, he had to squeeze them in. So here the egret is just too big, even for that double elephant folio size paper. And so he has, he's composed the bird in a way where he poses it with its neck down and even twist it around in order to fit it inside the picture frame. On the right, I've given you the frigate bird so that you can see where at the top there, um, the talons of the bird. Here's an example of where one of Audubon's plate actually includes a diagram of an anatomical part. Um, and this here, you can understand why, because he's giving you a top down view of the frigate bird. And so you wouldn't know what the talons of the frigate bird were like if you didn't do that. Okay, a third and final philosophical idea expressed in Audubon's paintings is vitalism. Saving the best for last, perhaps the greatest achievement of Audubon's art is its presentation of the living semblance of nature. It captures the spirit or soul of birds, each species as a living being. This facet of nature conveyed by Audubon's art is a metaphysical principle. It is the vitalistic core at the heart of nature, a principle left out of any merely physicalistic uh, description of nature. I'm going to give you a few quotes here by Audubon and by his contemporary transcendentalist Emerson. The first quote is in the opening passage, passage of Emerson's uh, essay titled Beauty. He says, the want of sympathy makes the ornithologist's record a dull dictionary. His result is a dead bird. The bird is not in its ounces and inches, but in its relations to nature. And the skin and skeleton you show me is no more a heron than a heap of ashes or a bottle of gases into which his body has been reduced is Dante or Washington. Audubon, in explaining his artistic goal, um, quotes here, in the, and this is the middle quote, he says, nothing after all could ever answer my enthusiastic desires to represent nature than to attempt to copy her in her own way, alive and moving. And another quote, that third one at the bottom, he says, I wanted a bird fresh from the hands of its maker. I wish to possess all the productions of nature, but I wished life with them. But let's turn to the stylistic features of Audubon's art that managed to convey such vitalism. Here's Audubon's paintings of the ivory-billed woodpecker, barn swallow, and long-billed curlew. First, supportive of approaching the inner life of nature's inhabitants is the composition. This composition manages to relate the viewer to the subject on intimate terms. For example, there is the lack of framing devices or obstructions between the viewer and the birds. The minimal distractions in the form of background scenery or other prominent objects. The close-up perspective, sometimes with a single bird filling the composition. And the birds situated at our level of uh, eyesight. So this is common. Then you can see that in each one of these paintings, that the birds at our level of sight. Um, so on, uh, at, in the ivory-billed woodpecker, we're actually up in the tree with the woodpeckers. With the barn swallow, we're up in the rafters of the barn. And with the curlew, we're down in the mud at the lake under the reeds. And you can see the city there in the background. For most of us, our routine observations of birds are never so close, direct, or personal. But in Audubon's paintings, we receive the hard-earned privileges of a woodsman as if high up in a tree, hanging from a cliff edge, or hidden amongst reeds on the shoreline, all things Audubon, in fact, did. More to the point, the soul of birds is conveyed by depicting their energetic and emotive lifestyles, sometimes in the form of many narratives. Contrary to the stiff, inanimate profiles of past ornithological art, Recall William Turton's ornithology page I showed you a few slides back. Audubon instead, his birds are shown indulgently eating, dramatically chasing prey, fighting off predators, building nests, 
grooming, caring for their young, chatting, there are so many mouths open, and proudly flaunting their bodies and abilities through stretching, twisting, and soaring. The birds possess biographies, not just physiologies, recalling Audubon's companion essays to the birds of America. And I'm showing you here his painting of the Virginian partridge on the bottom left, a great American hen and young. Um, it's the wild turkey. And on the right, um, a mockingbird. And you can see in the mockingbird painting, you have this rattlesnake right here, that's mouth open, and it's going for the bird's eggs in the nest. The rattlesnake's wrapped around the tree, and the mockingbirds are energetically fighting it off. On the left, you have this bird of prey coming down on the partridges, lots of action. On the bottom left, on the uh, I'm sorry, that was the top left, the Virginian, Virginian partridge. And on the bottom left, you have uh, the wild turkey with its with its chicks on the bottom there, trying to keep up with mom. You can see some are falling over. Here are Autobahn's paintings of the blue jay, the Carolina parrot, and the broad-winged hawk. Um, with the blue jay, you can see how they're indulgently eating some bird's eggs that they've stolen. This bird on the left has got one stuck on his bill. This one on the right um, catching some of the droppings from the egg above. The Carolina parrots. Parrots are known for being really chatty, and Audubon talks about um, all the uh, socializing that they would do up in the trees along the riverbanks in Illinois and Kentucky. Um, and here you can see he's depicted a whole bunch of them up in the tree, and they've got their mouths open, some of them. They're looking at us. This one on the left seems to be waving. It has its talon up. And on the bottom right, you have the broad-winged hawk, and I like how it's uh, displaying its wing for us. In fact, this hawk here, this bird, the broad-winged hawk, Audubon's specimen for it was a bird that he had sent his brother-in-law up a tree and captured it um, in its nest. And then Audubon managed to bring it back to his studio. And he says that it stayed on a stick for him while he painted it. And then he released it out the window. Okay, I want to make one more final remark. Um, one more final remark is worth making about Audubon's art and conveying the life of birds. This is that it does not fall prey to blindly over sentimental, sentim sentimentalizing nature, it does not fall prey to that. Life also involves death, struggle, and limitation. Hence, Audubon further depicts both tender scenes as well as necessary brutalities. Audubon's art achieves a reverence for nature that in Emerson's words, quote, builds altars to the beautiful necessity. And we can simply go back to the rattlesnake and the mockingbird for example of that. Well, thank you everyone so much for your patience. I appreciate you all coming. And I have here some recommended readings that I thought I would show you, um, suggest to you. There's um, some historical texts that you might check out. Um, the first one is Audubon's ornithological biography. That's the one that contains a, um, a few dozen of nice essays about his outdoor rambles, as well as essays on all the individual bird species. Then there's Audubon's um, um, a collection of his writings. This is a modern collection by the Library of America called Writings and Drawings. Um, Emerson's great book, Nature, is worth checking out, and his essay, Beauty, that I cited. Um, and then there is some nice modern uh, texts that are worth checking out, a biography by Richard Rhodes. Um, this biography from 2004 actually won the Pulitzer Prize. Um, and lastly, I suggest um, a really beautiful art book, uh, hardback, large print, called Audubon's Aviary, that contains excellent reproductions of the original watercolors, the original paintings of Audubon's um, uh, work for the Birds of America. There are also some scholarly essays in that book as well. Thank you so much again. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Wow, that was fantastic. Uh, I, I'm like just the idea of him taking the 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 
he had, he, obviously he did release the one bird that you talked about, but the idea of him putting the birds on the positioning boards, but they were they were dead, you know, but then he made them so alive. Anyway, sort of hard to jive all that, but um, all right, I have some questions here in the chat and anyone else is welcome to, to uh, chime in with questions, but let's start with the chat. We have um, Susan Forbes who said, um, great presentation, many thanks. What media would Audubon use? Oils, watercolor, and how long would it take him to complete one of these plates? And it looks like some someone answered it down below and said, watercolor, pastel, gouache, and charcoal. Yeah, so he, he worked in multimedia and he, he figured out what method worked best for him um, over time. So, and this was happening while he was a merchant, while he was rambling about the frontier, he was he was working with different medium to see best what worked best to capture, you know, these subtle effects that birds have to their body. Um, um, oh, and I, I meant to say, that's right. I have, I forgot to show you as an aside, unrelated, that um, I brought to share with you a copy, first edition of the ornithological biography here. So I work in an archive too at the University of Southern Illinois. And we, not about a year ago, acquired a first edition of his ornithological biography. So I thought I would um, go grab that. I'm here in my office today and just show that off to you. Cool. Very cool. Um, so we have Dakota Evans said, I love the heron. Very nice visuals. I've not seen some of these. Always enjoy you combing philosophy and art. Obviously, he knows you. Yeah, thanks. And then uh, Sharon Pap says, oh, she had answered about the mediums. Um, and then she said, thank you, everyone, for a nice presentation and lecture. And uh, Connie Cronin also said, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thanks so much for your great presentation. Does anybody else ha have any questions? I just have a quick question. Um, going back to the actual um, production of the work. Do you have any idea how long it would take him to, to create one of these, you know, elephant sized uh, uh, folio pages? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't give you a definite number, but um, I know he worked hard and fast because he would actually, um, during the years that he was he was gathering a collection of the different species in his paintings, he actually would regularly destroy them because he was, every year he would do this on his birthday for a number of years he did this in order to force himself to get better. Um, so yeah, he, he was, you, you know, he, he was practicing, he was innovating, he was experimenting. And, um, I wanted to also make a, I, someone mentioned the killing of the birds and this is true. He most of the time would go out on his rambles and he would kill the birds. And this was in part because at that time one hunted, um, for food. Um, you couldn't just easily go to the supermarket and get whatever it is you wanted out on the frontier. It was hunting birds was a common practice. It was like fishing today. Um, also is the only way you could possibly paint a bird. You know, um, we didn't have, they didn't have cameras at the time. So you couldn't snap a picture and then paint from a camera. So Audubon was, um, this was the practice was to kill them and then take them back. But nicely Audubon actually, there's a number of places where he remarks on the indiscriminate killing of birds, because that was also a practice by his contemporaries and he didn't appreciate it. So he has a lot of negative remarks to say about, you know, people picking off the passenger pigeons and how sick that makes him and, and similar uh, practices. Well, that's good to know. <laughs> Cause you know, you do think of like, in order to compile all that work, the number, the sheer number of birds that he had to kill, but as you say, I guess it was more accepted. Anyway, does anybody else have any? I, I do, I do, Peggy. Um, I was, <clears throat> I was wondering, you know, with his interest in transcendental philosophy, uh, you know, nineteenth-century American transcendental philosophy. Did he ever meet and talk with any of these philosophers, like Emerson and, or or others? I mean, Emerson was a little bit after him, I think. But um, I'm curious, uh, did he have a relationship with any of them? 
Yeah, not that I'm aware. I don't know of him running into them. He didn't, Audubon didn't, I think, spend too much time in New England. You know, he didn't move around a lot in order to uh, find the different species for his book project, but he never resided in the Northeast, except once he moved to New York, of course, later in his life. But I don't know of any times he mentions in, uh, uh, Emerson or Thoreau um, or other transcendentalists. That said, though, Thoreau and and the transcendentalists actually cite Audubon. So they knew of Audubon and they they fondly uh, cite his 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 uh, his his work on nature and his art. Um, Audubon was bumping shoulders, though, with all kinds of sci uh, scientists of that era in the United States and even in Europe. Audubon spent time in uh, England and in Scotland and on the continent. And um, yeah, there are a lot of stories of him interacting with different ornithologists and other scientists of his period. But it's true, they were contemporaries, but kind of halfway contemporaries. So Emerson publishes his first book in 1836. And then he gets on the lecture circuit around that time and is traveling around the Northeast primarily, but then further out West too in the forties, fifties and sixties. So I think maybe Audubon might've just missed him. All right. Well, if no one else had any questions, then thank you very much. And We'll see you uh, for our next program, which is November 30th at the East End Seaport Museum with Tom Damiani, all about winter ducks. So thank you, Nick. Everyone have a great evening. Welcome. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. Oh, really enjoyed really it. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Teresa.